Hello everybody and welcome to part 4 of machine learning for Forex and stock trading analysis. Now that we've seen our data, let's actually talk about our goals. What do we want to do here? Generally with machine learning, everything's going to boil down to actually machine classification. So with quant analysis, generally the first few things that you're taught are these quote unquote patterns, right? Head, shoulders, teacup, whatever else, silly names that they've got. There's tons of these patterns though, right? And so, so what's the theory behind these patterns? Well, the idea is that prices of stocks or forex ratios are a direct reflection of psychology of the people trading, right? So the traders, either people or computers, right? It's, you, I guess you wouldn't want to call it totally psychology, but maybe the variables that built up to make that pattern, right? So the people or computers, they're making decisions based on a bunch of these variables. And the theory is when the same variables present themselves again, you'll get a similar pattern. So you'll get a repeat of actions that create that similar pattern. And then the outcome as well is likely to be very similar, right? The further we move away from that pattern, um, the higher the, the likelihood of, of the similarity of the outcome changing, but you don't have to move too far away from the pattern. Really, you just need to move far away enough for you to actually execute a trade. Um, and that's all you really need. And really, with quant analysis and algorithmic trading or um, automatic trading, um, that really doesn't need to be too far out since the computer can actually execute the trade uh, pretty quick, faster than you will be able to. So what we want to do here, at least our initial goals, are one, we want to create a machine learned batch of what will end up being quite possibly millions of algorithms and the results, uh, which is going to be used to predict future outcomes compared to um, you know the outcomes in the past of these exact same algorithms now obviously as time goes on we can we can cut out some old algorithms like if you don't want to use the same algorithm from like years ago <laughs> right? or, or you might not want to or maybe you want to weight it differently but um, as you're gonna find out as we get through this there's a whole bunch of options that we can do so we're gonna kind of you know, put them on the table, but we won't get too in, in depth. Otherwise, uh, we would never make progress, but you can imagine. Anyway, two, what we want to do is actually test uh, this basic theory, right? So the beauty of machine learning is this, this notion of what's called data snooping, right? So data snooping is basically like making new inferences after looking at your data. Um, so with machine learning, data snooping is actually built in, right? <laughs> Uh, and so at, on the outset, if, if you don't really look too in-depth into what machine learning is actually doing, you might actually accuse it of, well, that's just machine learning and that's, that's no good, right? But what, what you're missing is that uh, data snooping is not only built in, but it's actually accounted for, right? It, it's, 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 a, it's really great, <laughs> right? So, so our, whole, um, our whole system here is, is really built on the inference of pattern recognition, not the algorithms itself. So if patterns change to new data, that's actually already built in and is done by programming that's done before we've even seen the results, right? So this allows uh, researchers to actually get the best of both worlds, right, while avoiding some of the pitfalls of, of data snooping. So what this is going to let us do is it allows backtesting to actually serve a really truthful and accurate purpose, right? So. <clears throat> if our if our machine learned live algorithm passes the back test in, in every sense of the word, right? So so uh, using you know historical data and only using historical patterns, is it still accurate as we move forward? And if if the answer to that is actually yes, then it's highly likely to continue performing well in the future as well, because it's actually the machine learned patterns that are paying out, not the not the exact pattern as it as it were you know that, that is profitable at the time so really it, it's it's confirming the hypothesis right with so we have an actual reason why we think this might work we're going to put it into action and if it does confirm then it actually confirms the hypothesis so that's what we're really looking for you know unlike finding like you know some sort of mathematical equation for no reason you just kind of kept flipping around variables until you found one and back testing it and holy moly we got great results this is this is going to make me bank. Well, no, that's that's unlikely. So, 
So with that, what we're going to do is take a range of data in succession. <clears throat> and to start, we're going to keep it really simple and so simple that it literally will be stupid, but we're going to do it. And what we're going to do is create a pattern with that data. So in this sense, and the reason why I say it's stupid is we're going to use a range of 10. And don't forget, we're using tick data. So a range of 10 in this tick data is really under most likely to be less than 10 seconds of a time frame. But most people aren't going to have bid ask tick data. They're going to have more like um, like uh, bar data, right? So open high, low, close data, and it might be it might be for uh, one minute open high, low, close, something like that. But not everyone's going to have this bid ask tick data. But if you pay for it, you you can actually get that data streaming. But anyway, beside the point. Uh, so it's going to probably turn out to be uh, too short of a range, but luckily something like this. Same thing with percent similarity, which we'll find out uh, way later on. And even, yes, the, the time length, um, all of this stuff can be machine learned to find the best of everything at the time, right? And again, it's not data snooping. It's just, it's built into the, to the machine. There's no new, program, uh, new programming that will take effect. It will just continue and continuously not only find the best patterns, but it will find the best length of pattern to care about, how long of a time frame do we care, and uh, how similar will we require these patterns. And, and in, not in this video, otherwise we would literally not do anything in this video. Probably a, a few more videos away, we'll, we'll get it in a little bit more detail about why that matters. Um, and why, like, maybe, like, why would we want to find out, like, how close, you know, wouldn't we want, like, a 100% match of patterns and all this kind of stuff? And, and no, the answer really is quite, quite firmly no. But anyway, um, so what we'll do is we're going to take this uh, range of data in succession and create a pattern with it. And the way that we're going to do it is with percent change. Now, uh, we want to normalize the data as best we can and so that we can use it. Um, everywhere, right? So even if the price has changed uh, that pattern, right? So if you just had a pattern of, let's say, $100, $101, $103, $102, $102, pattern, if you required it to be like that, wouldn't match the, you know, $10, you know, $10.20 or whatever that pattern was I just said, right? It wouldn't match, even though it, graphically it would be identical. So we want to normalize that data. Now, the preferred method probably to normalize data is to do it logarithm logarithmically, but we're not going to do that. We're going to use percent, percent change just to keep it as simple as possible. And the next thing to consider is, is uh, how we're going to do this percent change. Now, the way that we're going to do it is we're going to do a forward percent change point to point or from starting point. So this means the longer that the pattern is, the more likely the end is to be less similar than the beginning but the actual direction and movements of the pattern will be will be very similar. So this can be useful since some patterns might take more time to react uh, to a movement than others. And we want the buildup, in my opinion, to be most accurate, right? And But what we actually want is uh, for the end to predict the future. And so if, if you wanted the end to be more accurate, you would do a reverse percent change, right? So from the last point, what is the percent change to point you know, number nine to point number eight, seven, six, point, whatever. Um, or you could do a point to point percent change and really make some stuff pretty stringent. But if you do point to point percent change, you run the risk of that that pattern doing some pretty wild, like it, it, it can be very different uh, visually, um, even though you might not think so, it can, it can wind up going, you know, in a completely different direction. So I don't think we want to do that. Now, Anyway, like I said before, all this stuff can be changed. There's already a lot of variables. Uh, and trust me, when it comes to variables, we're going to be very, very busy. Some of them, luckily, can be machine learned very easily. The other ones can be machine learned very difficultly. difficultly. But for now, forward starting point. Now, this means that first we need to store a bunch of patterns in the percent change format. In reality, in our back test, um, that will actually mimic this, your patterns can only obviously come from the past, right? So when we do back test it, we won't be able to be like, well, this pattern from May 1st looks a lot like this pattern on May 8th, right? You can't do that. Um, so then what we do 
is compare the current pattern to similar patterns in the past, you know, using this percent change. And again, this can be done logarithmically, but, and it might be better that way, but the goal here is to keep things, things as simple as possible. And then what we can do is if, when we find similar patterns, we can look at what was the outcome of those similar patterns in the past. So, um, let's actually uh, code something now. <laughs> And um, so the first thing we need to code is a percent change function. We could do this by hand every time, but we're going to be doing a lot of percent change. So it would just make sense to go ahead and shorthand this for ourselves. So we'll want to do this. So we're going to define percent change. And in the parameters, we're going to say we want a start point and a current point. So, you know, from what to what are we going to do percent change to? Oops and uh, colon down here. Now we'll, what we want this function to do is actually return a value. So like if you do like one plus one, that returns a two. So we want something very similar to that. So like if we were to write out this equation, it would actually do return. So we want this to always return what a mathematical equation in the kind of same manner, right? So what we want is, you know, for anybody that doesn't know percent change, I don't know why you'd be watching this, but percent change is new minus the old divided by the old times 100. Just like ingrain that into your head. Because every now and then I see people do a different form of percent change and it really bothers me. I mean, there's, there's good reason for it sometimes, but seriously. New minus the old divided by the old times 100. So we'll have the new here, new minus the old divided by, you know, whatever the old is. And then outside here, you would do times 100. So just get your parentheses all nice and pretty. So new current point minus the old start point divided by the old, so that start point, and then times 100. Then our parentheses are all pretty already. Now, uh, the next thing that we want to do is actually program a function that is going to use percent change and just go through everything and make all these percent change uh, patterns. And so that's that's what we're going to be doing in the next video. So um, you're welcome for a percent change and a bunch of talking. <laughs> anyway, um, hopefully that sounds interesting to you guys. Hopefully you guys are exciting, uh, excited for the future videos. As always, thanks for watching.